so we're I think we're both on the same week of quarantine. I think you're on week eight of quarantine. So what have you been doing to uh, pass the well, time? Well, of course, uh, I'm practicing at least uh, three or four hours a day. I'm uh, listening, uh, listening, trying to listen to entire operas, at least one a day. And uh, I've been doing a harmonic analysis of a couple of our uh, tuba repertoire pieces. It's kind of keeping me busy. Other than that, um, uh, watch two or three movies on Netflix every day and uh, just uh, enjoying the relaxed pace. It is actually giving, in seriousness, it is giving an opportunity to uh, just go through uh, music that uh, maybe I've been wanting to get to certain things and it just doesn't seem to make sense. And now there's no sense of time in, in, in the idea that, well, if I do that, then I'll be late tomorrow doing this or that. So. Consequently, it really is a reflective opportunity and a investigative opportunity. I think I'm hearing that from a lot of people that it's really restructuring the way they look at a, like a daily schedule. It's uh, totally different. Yeah, and I would say there's a lot of pressure to be productive in this time, um, just because there's a lot of people who are doing a lot of creative things. So, I mean, what do, what do you think about that? What do you think about all these people who are putting out a video every single day of, of them playing a duet with themselves? Or, I mean, I think, it's, I think it's wonderful, but I think there's a lot of pressure on a lot of people to put out a lot of, you know, creative material right now. In a sense, this is what we talk about almost every day when we meet with students or workshops, you go to colleges, universities, and you say, well, well you know, remember that old thing, put on your thinking hat, you know, start thinking about what you could do with your skills. Where are there opportunities to explore and to um, exhibit uh, abilities and techniques and things that you're interested in? And I think a lot of these things will fall away. In a sense, it's very noisy now on the internet. I mean, you're constantly getting this or that to, to look at or to see this and that. But uh, gradually we're getting to find like silos of information or interest and to take advantage of looking at other people's how, how do they creatively express themselves on their instrument or with music or in some general way. The fact that it, um, you know, it's almost like uh, watching what is that fail where you see people having trouble doing things and all that. I mean, it's always more interesting to see 10 seconds of something that ends up in a, an abysmal going off a cliff or something. I think even that we're getting a little better pacing. We're not so anxious to click on to the next thing that, you know, from my point of view, say I was two months ago. Oh, that's not very interesting. Click, no, no, no. click, 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 click. Now you actually spend a little more time and you, you look at it maybe a little bit differently. So even that, I, th I think our whole sense of pace, the frenetic need to get to the top is maybe not quite as, as important this minute. Yeah, yeah, I think, you know, in, in not this time, there's a lot of pressure to put out something perfect on the internet. And right. right now, because there's so much material, you're maybe hearing something that isn't entirely perfect. And I think you see the Brandon or Caleb, we're talking about this in one of the other chats that I think, and I, I think this too, I just think it's, it's totally okay to put out something on the internet that maybe isn't perfect, you know, and uh, I don't know, I just think there's real value in just putting things out there and getting feedback and feeling accomplished during this time. Sure. Well, I think it's a, a, an interesting progression because when people used to do, you'd have to do an entire recording live uh, because of the technique. They couldn't record. They didn't have tape and so forth. And then it got into tape where you could make some alterations, but it still had a very live feeling. And then we got to the point in the last 20 years where everything had to be perfect. You're listening to a CD or a recording or Spotify and, and then you hear the, uh, the the third person in the X Philharmonic miss a note way back in the thing, and you ferret that out and say, well, that shouldn't have been released. You know, it's not perfect. And in a sense, the video, uh, you can see cuts. You can see uh, if somebody actually does five cuts in a video, you're going to be very aware of it. You're going to be aware if a video is straight through. So now we're back to the live, and we accept and maybe even encourage the idea of going out to the edge and, and don't make it so perfect. Don't look more for the idea of a great musical event or a great experience or a very small less spiritual musical experience, something that gives you a little different. Um, we did speak about perfect though. And um, first of all, we should just remind everybody we're, we're the uh, 
this is the tuba contingent of the Canadian brass and we do these daily webcasts, um, trumpet, horn, I know you're probably not that interested in trumpet, horn, and trombone, but the tuba every Thursday, and then on Wednesday, the entire group. And my co-host is this uh, exceptional young talent, Jarrett McCourt, whom you've met on the other uh, broadcast. And between us, we're comparing notes and uh, kind of looking at the entire tuba world and deciding what's important to us and finding out where those importances converge. And... Um, Jared just introduced the idea of perfect and perfect playing. Well, we have a guest today that would represent uh, as near a perfect uh, tuba performer as you ever want to meet an, an amazing, an amazing tuba player um, from Europe. He's actually from Norway. And uh, Jared, perhaps you'd like to introduce our guest. Yeah, I will, uh, I will let him in in just one second. But I think Oisin Badzevik is... I mean, it says this on his website, but I also think this is that he is sort of the only tuba player who has carved out a career uniquely as a soloist and who hasn't come at it from either an orchestral job or a teaching career and does so many cool things and has so many cool stories to tell. Um, I first met him at Domaine Forge, uh, I think six or seven years ago, and I went twice just to study with him. And he's just such an inspirational person. Uh, and I'm really excited to talk to him and and hear what where's, he's up to in this time. Jared, where's Domaine Forget? You might want to tell people where that is and what it is. Oh yeah, so Domaine Forget is a uh, music camp uh, run for two weeks every summer. It's like a brass specific music camp uh, in the northeast corner of Quebec. Um, and it's a beautiful place and it's just a, a really good place to go during the summer to get some inspiration and to work with some really great colleagues and great teachers as well. Have you been out there, Chuck? Yes, yes. We've performed there a, a couple of times. We, we brush off our very poor French and do our best at the domain. I'm, you, you speak French, right? Jerry? Yeah, yeah. I was born in Quebec. Oh, born? No, no, I'm kidding. I didn't know that part. Yeah. So are you, you, you weren't part of the separatist movement. I mean, I, we shouldn't talk politics. <laughs> I was going to okay, say we could along. we could we could lose some uh, some guests here if we're <laughs> going to start talking about that. Anyway, so let me let me uh, let Oystein and we can start talking to him. Joining, joining. Does Oystein know yet that I have uh, Norwegian heritage? No. Okay, we'll we'll mention that later. <laughs> and he's connecting. And he's connected. Hello, Oystein. Hey. Oystein, nice, good to see nice you. Nice to wow. see you. Are you in Norway presently? Might be in a silence. Okay. Room. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Can you hear us? I can hear you. I actually okay. followed your, uh, your uh, broadcast um, from the beginning. Oh, uh oh. Well, we were a little late, as you <laughs> noticed. That's uh, North American. So are you, in uh, fact, in Norway this very moment? Yes, I'm in my uh, practicing studio here in Norway. I see a lot of what I think you've uh, adapted your room to be, a sound. Yeah, so... Oh, I thought that was a, uh, a sound uh, baffle board, but it looks like a bed. Let me see here. I guess that's an opportunity to, uh, to rest okay. between the... Yeah, so, um, yeah, this is my practicing studio. It's uh, a lot of wood, as you can see. There's a nice little view here. I'm not sure if you can see the view. Oh, wow. Here. Yeah, so I see the, the ocean. It's a little bit like Domaine Fogé, actually. <laughs> and that's my piano, and that's a little guest bed my daughter is visiting, so she's having this room uh, tonight. So, yeah. Well, while, while you couldn't hear us, we decided the bed was there because... Uh after your two or three hour practice session, you'd maybe take a half an hour off to get back to the next two or three hours. <laughs> there you go, yeah. that's it. <laughs> Perfect. So we've seen a lot of, uh, you've been on YouTube a lot. A lot of your solos are, are easily accessible. But uh, as Jarrett mentioned earlier, as you were joining, uh, you are right now the only tuba player that we could decide between us that is actually has a, a performing career not associated with another organization, an actual soloist. Uh, where does that take you and what kind of schedule do you keep? <laughs> right now, the schedule is pretty miserable. 
but uh, but yeah, on a regular basis, I, I travel all over the world. So so this spring and summer, I was supposed to be in Lithu uh, Lithuania, and I was supposed to be uh, in Canada, in the U.S., and uh, Jeju in South Korea. So I mean, uh, it's it's just canceled everywhere, but. You know, you you get to do some of the things that uh, has been on the to-do list for quite a while, and the touring has sort of mm -hmm. stopped it. But now I have the opportunity to actually uh, to catch up with some of that. And it, it involves composing music. It involves recording some stuff. I actually, I love what you just talked about putting mm -hmm. out non non perfect uh, performances right. on YouTube. Mm -hmm. So that's part of the part of the thing I do. What would you consider your typical audience? Who who is out in front of you when you're performing? It varies quite a lot. Uh, obviously, I play for tuba players. When I tour in the U.S., I normally go to universities and I play for the students. And normally, you see a kind of a brass-heavy uh, tuba-heavy uh, uh, audience. But I also play a lot with orchestras like when i play with the taipei symphony in uh, in uh, taiwan i'll see a like a really broad variety of audiences so i have a following in different countries that are really different when mm -hmm. i go to poland and play with the warsaw philharmonic for example there is a just a bunch of normal people <laughs> if if you could say that which is refreshing of course because they tend to listen in a different way than people right. that play just the tuba well you probably and, are aware that uh, for years harvey phillips uh was a very important uh tuba proselytizer here in, in uh, well i guess in the world but certainly in north america and his intention was to to give the tuba a status of a a serious entrant in the music world and that it could uh, hold its own against say string or woodwind uh, soloists and so forth and um, his objective was to uh, really encourage anybody that was a writer, a composer, to, to write for the tuba. Uh, I would imagine this is uh, something that you, you were aware of, Harvey's influence. And did that really take the tuba? Has that, has that really made that mark? Did we bust through that, uh, that ceiling? Not yet. Uh, I studied actually for Harvey for um, for quite a bit uh, back in the 90s, and uh, I'm very aware of the fantastic work that he's been doing and his vision. And I think he kind of liked that I had a similar vision mm -hmm. of reaching out there to, to kind of non-brass playing uh, audiences. Uh, I don't think we're right there yet, but um, there are people coming up. Uh, I would like to mention... Uh, friend of mine, former student that's called Daniel Heskedal. He is a Norwegian tuba player that is also a composer. And he wrote, uh, I mean, he's written a lot of great music playing the tuba with the music. And he just wrote uh, uh, music for a Brad Pitt production uh, movie, which I think, I mean, uh, that's kind of what I'd like to see. That's what I want to see. The tuba being sort of influencing into domains that we haven't seen it yet and i've done some of that daniel is on the, his way doing more of that and definitely harvey was one of those uh, along with roger bobo john fletcher michael lynn and yourself not to mention i mean it, it's really really important work that you've done to reach out and i i, I still think we we have some way to go but we're really getting there there was a period in time in the 50s uh, when jingles was a big deal. In other words, these one hour uh, advertising jingles would be recorded. And um, New York was the hotbed for that. And a, a tubist, Don Butterfield, and at the time, made a point of uh, taking his tuba around and playing for every contractor, the person hiring people for these jingles. He would play for them and uh, just demonstrate what a tuba could do. And by the end of that era, the jingle era, the tuba was well established as a integral player in that mark. But it took somebody like Don uh, going to that effort, really going out and, and showing people what was possible. And I think in each era, there's somebody that kind of rises to that 
that position. And it, it looks like you're in that spot right now to, to say, hey, the tuba is a, an actual solo instrument, and I'd like you to hear this and take a look at that, and uh, perhaps you'd uh, like to have me come and play with the orchestra. Yeah, you know, I, I had released a CD back in the 90s, 94, I think it was, with tuba and piano, and I think it was pretty good. got great reviews, and I thought, okay, it's time to lean back and wait for the phone to call. Um, <laughs> And as you can imagine, um, the phone didn't call very much. Well, I got invite invited to some of those uh, more brass-centered um, events, but I couldn't really imagine why isn't the orchestra calling? And it took a while for me to realize that in, in order to present something like Butterfield did uh, for an employer that hasn't heard it before, you actually have to go and show them. So it wasn't after that I did my tuba carnival CD with string orchestra and tuba, that the phone actually started calling. Uh, and, and, and that's pretty, uh, that's pretty uh, interesting because you have to be very, uh, how can I put it, very concrete in the way you present something. Well, you, can't much sell, so. yeah, you can't sell toothpaste just by describing it. <laughs> you have to show it. And I think the people that, uh, and I know in our own, in our own career, and you probably identify with this, there was a moment in Europe where it was very difficult for us to get a, um, you know, a typical manager or agency, because they had a strict uh, division between the A music, Ernst, serious music, and light music, yeah. and yeah. we didn't represent either one totally. We weren't totally serious, and we weren't totally light. We were something in between, and it took someone, yeah. uh, uh, a lady in, uh, in uh, uh, she was handling the King Singers, Erica Eslinger, uh, thought that there was a little bit of comparison between us and the King Singers in the sense the Kings could, at the end of their program, do uh, uh, encores and light things and so forth. And she took a chance, and once we could get to the actual audiences, we were fine. But you always have that middle, the middle management. I think that's what you're talking about. Somehow you have to show them or tell them, or demonstrate, convince them yeah. that uh, what you're doing is serious. It is right. And I actually had the pleasure of listening to one of your concerts in London. I think it was 1981. <laughs> and it, it was a packed Queen Elizabeth Hall in London. And I actually went twice. I saw the concert <laughs> one of the nights and I came back the second night. <laughs> Just I loved it, and and I think that must have been in the period of time where you really had the break in Europe. Uh, it felt like that at least. That was exactly 1980. one exactly when we uh, began. It took that long, if if uh, you know, considering that we had already played uh, Carnegie Hall, and we'd already been uh, across the states many 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 times. Still breaking into Europe was was quite different. And I wouldn't say it's exactly different yet. I don't think it's, it hasn't made a total turnaround. I'm sure you're still facing that. that uh... Yeah, I mean, you have other brass groups like Nossil Brass that is making an audience Wait, for themselves. But... What, what, not so much, but no. <laughs> <laughs> Very and, much so. Uh... And, and of course, we have the Norwegian Brass Brothers, which is wait, the wait, brass Norwegian quintet Brass with... Brothers. Let me write that down. <laughs> <laughs> which is, uh, yeah, kind of a brass quintet with drums. And, and yeah, there's a bunch of, uh, I would say, groups that has been clearly inspired by what you did uh, in, in the early 80s and uh, kept on doing. But they're doing different things, and that's the thing. You can't really expect to be doing exactly what what you did and then have success. And the, the fun thing is that uh, a symphony orchestra seem to be doing that. You have symphony orchestras that that do exactly the same as people have done for 200 years, 300 years. And not only that, they do exactly the same as orchestras are doing all over the world. So this, there is... Uh, it's actually quite amazing that they ma manage to keep an audience by doing the exact same thing as has been done before. Um, especially for me, looking at this as, as a kind of an entrepreneur, from an entrepreneur standpoint, uh, it, it's strange. I don't ever see a time in the future where tuba is so mainstream that it's, it's going to be as usual a solo instrument as a violin in a symphony orchestra, for example. I never, 
actually expect that to happen, given the orchestra's really uh, traditional programming. Right. Uh, yeah. Well, Jared, you might weigh in, in on this because I think repertoire, the orchestra enjoys an amazing uh, several hundred years of repertoire, and particularly when you get into the big works, the late 1800s and early 1900s, that this does suggest a, a long curve for orchestras. A lot of it is the same, and, and a lot of times you want to hear the same, you want to hear standard rep. But for tuba, the tuba solos, people only started writing serious tuba solos in the last year, no, 10 years, 20, 30 years. Uh, prior to that, it was always some kind of a, a, a game, like uh, Beelzebub or the strongest man in the high school band is the man that plays the tuba. And Yuba plays, the, but by the way, a tuba solo I do love when Yuba plays the tuba, the rumba on the tuba zone in Cuba. That's an important word. In Cuba, yeah. Um, no, I mean, I mean it, it's so true, and I think especially always seen with, with your own compositions, um, they are really wonderful. I heard you do your own concerto at iTech in Bloomington a couple years ago, and was really stunned with that. Uh, one of the things that I was going to ask you about was that, you know, you've recorded, I'm not sure how many albums you have now. Is it seven? Uh, it's 11, actually. 11. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. I'm so sorry. I need to find those. Got to catch up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, and I mean, you've recorded uh, more or less like all the standard solo repertoire, but you've also recorded some really sort of stuff that's off the beaten path. And I have to say, I mean, I love your Christmas album. And I also love um, your most recent album uh, with Indian influences. And oh, yeah. uh, the track a tribute to Bach is something that I listen to when I'm running on the treadmill. Um, so I wanted to ask you, I mean, what, what do you like recording or what do you like playing the best? I mean, do you get a lot of joy out of playing standard literature, Vaughn Williams with an orchestra, or do you like playing new compositions? I mean, wh where, where is your interest right now? It varies quite a bit. And in order to understand what I record, I have to mention that the reason I record stuff is because it's it talks to me and I I'm easily bored so I tend to avoid making kind of the virtuoso tuba one virtuoso virtuoso tuba part two and three and four and just keep on doing the same thing so that's why you see that I'm doing recordings with rock uh, well uh, jazz players uh, I record with string orchestra record with uh, yeah, an Indian violinist, as you say. It's just out of curiosity. I'm an, I'm a musical explorer. That's probably the the best word I can find for it. So that kind of defines what I'm doing. And in that same vein, you know, one of the things that I love most about your playing is that your interpretations are sometimes very different than other tuba players' interpretations. Um, and I'm just, I'm a, what do you think the importance is for tuba players or soloists period to record things um how they like to hear it instead of for example you know taking somebody else's interpretation and just sort of trying to copy that well i mean you probably said the answer yourself here you you pretty much have two choices as a musician as far as i'm seeing it and canadian brass is a really good example of that either you do what everybody else does but then you've got to do it better than everybody else. Or you do something that nobody else does, and then you can do it your way. So you can see it in, in brass quintet playing, for example, is entertainment seg segment. There is nobody doing it better than Canadian brass. There's a lot of people trying to do it, but it cut, doesn't cut it. But then you have uh, those like Nossil brass that does a totally different thing again, or the brass brothers, and that works. So, me as a, as a soloist, uh, I try to do some of the repertoire that other people do, but I try to do it my way. And I really think that that is the key to success in this business. And I, I try to tell students that too, that that they should try to do it their, their, their own way. Now, that being said, I truly believe in, in the process of learning something, I truly believe in imitation. And this is something 
that I've heard a lot of criticism towards in, for example, brass teaching. Never try to sound like somebody else. A lot of teachers say that to students, which is kind of dangerous because uh, you end up not learning the language. Uh, and I, if you look at, for example, how a kid learns to speak English or Norwegian, he'll start to imitate his parents and try to copy what they're saying and copy the, the way they say the words and the style and, and the tempo, everything. And eventually, when he grows older, it doesn't take long sometimes can be really original in the age of four, <laughs> but it has been a, a period of imitation leading up to it. And that's very important to remember. So don't be afraid, I would say, to imitate your uh, role models. And then later on, when you've learned the skills, when you learn the language, then you can go on to your own thing. Well, that's fantastic. You know, that's exactly what I heard when I was studying as a young, I think, teenage uh, with Mr. Jacobs, Arnold Jacobs. And he simply, he'd tap you on the knee and he'd say, do you like my playing? You say, well, of course, that's, that's why I'm here. Well, imitate me. He says, when you can sound like I do, then you can create your own path. That's a heck of a standard. But what he was yeah. basically saying is what you're saying. It's like the language approach. Imitate to the extent that you can imitate and that puts you on the right track without having to overthink it. It's just sonic. It's in your head rather than, uh, uh, or in your heart, I guess, instead of just in your brain that you're trying to do something or that. You're just trying to replicate the sound. That's fantastic that you, you pass that on to students because that is something that I've heard both sides of where teachers will insist that somebody never plays something the same twice. And you think, no, it's your attempt to play it the same. It'll never be the same. And that's that's the beauty of creating you know an artistic uh, song or something another thing that i would like to add to um uh, to my advice for students is that music music is about giving not receiving and it has to do with the fact that when you sit on i, I judge solo competitions sometimes i listen to young players try to impress me with their playing and uh, what I see is very often somebody that wants something. They're sitting on stage and they want uh, recognition. They want big applause. They want big numbers on the score sheet. They want the prize money. They want honor and glory. And, and they want great grades from their teachers. And it's all about me, me, me getting something. And that's totally opposite of what music should be about, which should be really unconditional giving. Mm -hmm. And and this is uh, a very surprising thing happens when you start to think about this, that I don't care if people applaud. I'm, I don't care what I get on the concert. Uh, I just care about trying to give something. If they like it, that's great. If they don't, at least I liked it. <laughs> so so, um, well, so this attitude lot, change is important. Yeah, and there's a lot of what you're saying there that... Uh... I think any musicians that feel they're even somewhat successful that they've had that that sharing it's not look at me i'm a great artist and if, if you don't enjoy what i'm doing there's something wrong with you it's you saying this is me this is my song can we share this and that's a beauty now you mentioned competition by the way uh this is how i first met jared he was performing a competition and outstripping all the other contestants and since you are one of his mentors maybe between us we should talk about jared a little bit not too much. Yeah. <laughs> a couple seconds. Sure. Uh, phenomenal player, really. I mean, we, we had some lessons up there at Domain and, and uh, yeah, truly, truly gifted to a player. Um, and also very curious to sort of take in um, impressions, which I think is key to development. Did he mention to you that he's uh, Canadian? Mm, I think up? I might have read it on the participant okay. list. Yeah, that, that usually disqualifies. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jared, when you were at the Memphis Ed, so what were your strong remembrances of the mentorship? You said that you went back, in fact, to to study more with Oystein. 
I mean, can we circle back to the nice comments about me? <laughs> no, no, we're done. With I'm that. Just <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I mean, I just, I mean, Oystein, you've been a big inspiration of mine for a long time, especially as a soloist. And uh, I, I really valued our lessons, especially so much to like go back and, and play for you again. And I remember in the first masterclass that I played for you, I was playing the first movement of the plow concerto. Um, and it's, it's a piece that I love dearly and your recording is sort of like my model recording. And I was trying some things with the tempo and I think one of the things that you were trying to do with me was trying to, I don't want to say rein me in a little bit, but just be a little bit more structured with things like rubato and tempo changes and follow a little bit more strict rhythm. Um, one of my questions for you is that, uh, so when you're trying to decide what to do with a phrase or how to insert your own musicality into a piece, I mean, where do you start? I, do you sing? Do you go to the piano? I mean, I know a lot of people do have different um, ways that they like to do this, but I'd love to hear what you think. Uh, yeah, I, I have a kind of a list. You know, you can, as Harvey Phillips once said to me, music is about building tension and releasing tension, much like breathing in, breathing out. And uh, you have to know very thoroughly what your tools are in order to do that. For example, in dynamics, you can generally say that when you play louder, you increase the tension. When you play softer, you release tension. Um, when you increase the tempo doing an accelerando, you also increase tension. And uh, when you play slower and slower, you decrease tension. When you play with a hard accent, uh, like I'm talking now, I'm talking really accented, right? That's more energy than if I'm sort of mellow in my way of talking. So mellow uh, articulation, low energy. Hard articulation, high energy. You've got, um, uh, let me see here, vibrato. If you use kind of just a little vibrato, uh, it'll have less energy. If you have large vibrato, it means more energy. If you use more rubato back and forth in, in tempo, also more energy, more espressivo, if you like, and, and less rubato, normally less uh, energy. And the eureka moment for me was when I discovered that I can interchange those things. For example, if it says fortissimo in the part, you normally as a brass player play as loud as you can and, and hope for the best right now when i discovered that i could get away with playing only uh forte even mezzo forte and i substituted the fortissimo with harder accents and more vibrato and it all of a sudden sounded more energetic than what if I had just played a straight violent fortissimo? And this was kind of a, a revelation. I think that is exactly what I tried to convey to you that tools and they're, they can actually do the same thing um, and you can interchange them. That, that was a really important lesson for me when I found that out. That's really good advice. Um... I mean, yeah, I, I remember specifically you talking about sort of using these tools sparingly. And the most advanced musicians are the ones who know exactly what tools to use and when. And the ones with sort of the most tools in their tool belt. And, you know, at the end of a piece, you can be like, well, I still have more tools. Like, uh, you know, I still have more music to make. But, but it's, it's fun, though. I mean, I rarely have to say on the master class, <laughs> do less rubato do less vibrato i mean so you're really an exception there normally i say what do more do more <laughs> but you can look at it as makeup if you look at a beautiful girl and you just view her as just stunning um well seen from my standpoint uh you really don't notice what makes her stunning you can't really pinpoint it oh it's the mascara oh it's the 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 whatever they put on the on their eyebrows um or it's it's this red uh, rouge here or it, it's really tough to say exactly what it is and you shouldn't be able to 
So I think in your case, when you did that on the masterclass, I could sit as an audience and I said, oh, that was a great rebuttal, or that was a fantastic vibrato he had right there. Oh, what a wonderful crescendo. But that's, you, you're trying to hide those things, right? You just want the audience to go and say, wow, what an, what an expressive musician, right? Yeah. Hide and, the tool. <laughs> yeah, and sort of in the same vein, when we were at Demand for Jet, I remember you were talking a lot about, um, I'm not sure when exactly it was, but you took a year off of taking gigs and performing opportunities to practice your tuba playing and your fundamentals. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, I just think that's incredible. Like <laughs> I wouldn't be able to do that because, you know, I'd be, you know, at the corner asking for people to, to give me crackers for dinner or something, you know, I, just, I wouldn't be able to survive it. And just the tenacity it takes to sort of take that time to zero in on your playing. Could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, do you know what I had for dinner during that year? I think you talked about bread and soup. No, no, I had onion and potato soup. Uh oh, so I, I cut up potatoes and onions and I put them in a, a, a boiling water, and that was my dinner because it was really cheap. So yeah, I mean, I was sitting there wondering what to do with my career, and I was. I was pretty decent tuba player. I had studied for Michael Lynn at the Royal Academy in Stockholm. Uh, but I sort of didn't, I had, didn't have this feeling that I had done the best I could. So I, I was watching my neighbor go to work eight o'clock in the morning, come back five o'clock in the afternoon. I said, hmm, maybe I should try that. Eight to five. Hmm? And uh, I, I did it. I sort of said to myself, I'm going to try this now. And I think I was maybe 24, 25 years old. I'm going to try this for one year to practice from eight in the morning until five in the afternoon and see where that takes me. And I'm not going to accept any gigs during that period because that would mess up my schedule. So when the Royal uh, Philharmonic in Stockholm called and asked me to sub for Michael Lynn, I said, no, I'm sorry, I'm practicing. When the phone was calling during a session, I said, or I didn't say it, but my wife said, he's busy, he's practicing, he can't, call, he can't take your call. So I was really rigorous. I'm going to show you the, the clock that I used. Yeah, so here we go. I'm not sure if this is, uh, is it like uh, mirrored or can you see it? Perfect. Okay, Perfect. cool. So I would start at eight and you see this, this arm here, it's a second. And I wouldn't play a note until it actually hit the top. And I would play for 20 minutes until it came down here to the four. And I would take a break until six and I, or until half. And I would start playing another 20 minutes, take 10 minutes off. This is actually inspired by Christian Lindbergh's I was just going to ask you if this is this a Norwegian thing, because Christian has that incredible video of his typical work day. And it's right, yeah. down, right down to the seconds like you're talking. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he was an inspiration then. He is still an inspiration. And he invited me to his, his place there so we could uh, practice together. I think it was last year. Uh, <laughs> fantastic inspiration. Anyway, so I did that for three hours. I had a half an hour break. I did it for another two hours. And it was time for lunch, half an hour. And it was two more hours and then I was pretty much done for the day. And the day was split up in on, like literally three parts. Start by warming up, that's number one. Number two was um, technical exercises like uh, improving your high register, low register, speed, legato, breathing, whatever you might think of valve action. And then thirdly, it was uh, learning repertoire. And that was the biggest part, like memorizing concertos and, and all of this stuff. So at five o'clock I was free. And can you imagine as a musician feeling absolutely no guilt for having practiced too little? That's, that's rare. <laughs> that's, that's fantastic. You know, we're not gonna have a lot of time and there's something I wanted to ask you when we're head on here because 
I think I might have gotten in a little hot water. We played in Norway some years ago, and the fellow picked us up at the airport and was driving us in. And I was sitting in the back seat, so I was behind the driver. Nice fellow. And I told him I had Norwegian heritage, but uh, my grandmother was actually Norwegian. And he thought that was nice. And I said, well, perhaps you know the family. And he said, well, what's the name? I said, well, the name is uh, Quisling. And the guy froze. I mean, he just absolutely froze at the thing. I thought, okay, I guess it's too soon. The, the actual name was Slatten, but it was not. Now, now what, what did I do wrong there? <laughs> well, Quisling is probably, uh, I, I think it's actually a, an English word too these days that is synonym to a traitor. Uh, because he was responsible during the Second World War for putting a lot of Norwegians into uh, concentration camps, uh, even um, killing them. So uh, he wasn't a very popular person, so to speak. So I guess I that's guess, what the, yeah, I guess triggered the reaction. That joke won't hunt, as they say. I guess I'll never do that again. It was quite fun, funny. I mean, funny afterwards. But uh... come, come back in 200 years and it'll be forgotten. <laughs> it'll be fine. <laughs> but not so, yet. <laughs> so how do, uh, compare uh, uh, your training in, in Norway with someone like Jared or even me way back. How, how does it compare that you would be streamed into a music profession uh, maybe at an early age? I think the biggest difference is that Norway is a very wind orchestra dense country. We yeah. have a, normally a wind orchestra at every single school in the whole country. Uh, this is almost a requirement. It isn't officially a requirement, but almost as they used to play on the 17th of May, the National Day of Norway. And they all expect wind bands to be out on the street playing for for people. They're not that popular the rest of the year, but that particular day, they're very needed. So that means we have a lot of tuba players. And when you have a lot of tuba players, I don't know, maybe we have like five, 6,000 tuba players in Norway on a population of 5 million people. So to, to do the math, it's pretty dense. And uh, that obviously leads to some of those guys being uh, like having a, an interest of, of pursuing it uh, further than others. So that's probably the most important thing, just the, the, the sheer numbers of players. And then, of course, we have really great teachers uh, as a result of that. Uh, that can, uh, yeah, encourage to play solos, encourage to do stuff that is, isn't that easy. And of course, also we have the brass bands, which, um, as you probably know, the British brass band has uh, tuba parts that are way more difficult than the normal wind band parts. So that also contributes to the quality. We talked to uh, Bramel Tovey uh, a week ago was England, he's a conductor, a major conductor in New York Philharmonic and so forth. And uh, he got his start as a tuba player in London, became Fletcher's assistant in the LSO. So, and somehow he felt that that didn't uh, detract at all from his musical quest. Uh, I think in North America, a tuba player was always, you just felt like that was going to be it. You know, I guess he couldn't play trumpet. <laughs> so it didn't, didn't leave. There might be another important difference between uh, Norway and the U.S. I noticed that, uh, for example, we have free education here in Norway. I'm, I'm just going to promote that because when you have free education uh, all the way to the top level, uh, you are you feel that it's more comfortable to experiment with your career to do something that might be on the edge of what's responsibly responsible but in the u.s when your parents pay hundreds and thousands of dollars for your education the experimental lust is maybe not so high you really feel that it's so much on the line here so you want to you, you really want to go in that particular direction and not deviate and experiment too much so that might be also one one reason and of course, obviously, in Germany, um, it's very, I mean, the whole education in Germany for tuba is very orchestral oriented. You, you really, um, same thing in England, 
the universities there really want people to start playing in an orchestra. Uh, for better or worse, I'm not really judging here, but for better or worse, Norway is a little bit more, they give the students more slack, which sometimes is disastrous, <laughs> but also sometimes uh, creates these uh, new expressions. That's great. I, I was sorry. just going to say, it's kind of timely in that uh, we're in that same phase now where uh, school, it's, it's, it's a loose term and, and nobody's going to school right now. So now people are comparing notes and really maybe expense. Oystein, you're a, you're a model tuba citizen. Uh, everything you're doing is, is really amazing. Jared? Yeah, I mean, we just had one question and I think it's really important at this time. I mean, you've given so much great advice for students who are trying to better themselves on their instruments uh, right now, especially with all this sort of subsidized time. And I think if they model their practice sessions after you did, um, when you took your year off, I think they're going to be very successful. But this question from Hunter Thomas is, what techniques or practices do you use to keep pushing forward when practice or music become frustrating? Well, uh, I guess as in all kinds of activities that re requires repeated practice sessions, you just have to believe in the end goal and just do it anyway. Because life can't always be just... And that's the thing. I mean, no musician that has had success has always been been happy when they're re re rehearsing or, or practicing. That, it doesn't exist. There is this equal amount of discipline, hard work, but also having fun. Uh, and I think if if there's if it's only discipline, if it's only hard work and only a struggle, then nobody's gonna be able to do it. So if you can put something in your hard work sessions that encourages you that that it could be a solo, a violin solo on the tuba that you just love playing for the sake of your musical sanity, then that could help too. So uh, it's you got to be your own teacher in a way and balance it so that you 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 give you a tap on the shoulder when you do something good, give you some nice, fun music to play, but also a kick in the butt when you need it. I think that's so important. And I mean, I just wanted to thank you for not only being a great inspiration for me musically as a tuba player, but also, I mean, some of the things you've said today, I think are just so important. Um, and there's so many great takeaways. So um, for anyone listening, these talks are always archived on the Canadian Brass Facebook page. So you can always go back and listen to all the gems that Oisin has dropped today. Um, but is there anything else you wanted to add, Oisin, before we close out? This <laughs> corona thing is this corona thing is gonna pass and uh, just keep the flame burning. That's what I want to end with. Thanks so much for joining us. This is really great. Really great to have you here up live and personal. And Jared is exactly right. Uh, do re-listen. There's some fantastic things you said today. It's really, really fun to to share some thoughts with you. Thank you so much. All right. Take care. Bye. You too.